Hey there, once again, YouTube. I am back in fine form, guys. I know I've been pretty busy lately. I have not been able to do many videos at all. I believe, actually, this is the first video I've done in 2020 having to do with earthquakes and such. So, just had a few things to talk to you guys about today, including the magnitude 7.7 .7 in Jamaica that occurred, and um, a recent 4.2 and an increase in seismicity in Hawaii, and a few other things, especially about Steamboat Geyser. But first, remember my website. And there's a link to this in the description box below to my website. If you go to my website and go to the more drop down menu and go to test your knowledge, there is a knowledge test, kind of a fun little thing I put together to test your guys' knowledge on some of the stuff I talk about every day and what certain seismic signatures look like. So you can go here and take this quiz. I think, uh, let's see, 27 questions. Um, it does not show me the results of people who do this. So if you do do this quiz, let me know your score in the comment section below. And now let's move on to Steamboat Geyser. Here we are at the Steamboat Geyser 2020 page on my website under the Yellowstone drop down menu, Steamboat Geyser Eruptions 2020, and of course two pages for 2019 and 2018 as well. Scooting down, we do see it did erupt two days ago. Remember guys, if you ever see a Steamboat Geyser eruption happen on the seismic stations at Yellowstone, simply come to my website here and I try to update it as soon, as quickly as I see a Steamboat Geyser eruption occur. And I do put the plots, the seismogram, spectrogram, and spectra plots to each and every Steamboat eruption ever since 2018. Actually, since the eruptive period began in early 2018, I have every single eruption detailed on my Steamboat Geyser eruption pages using the seismogram, spectrogram, and spectra plots. Now, the most recent steamboat eruption is the third eruption of 2020, which is the 83rd, yeah, 83rd eruption since it reactivated in early 2018, and the 51st eruption since the beginning of 2019. Now, is activity calming for steamboat? Maybe, but it no longer is erupting every week. Regardless, 2018 through the present is the most active period that Steamboat Geyser has ever seen in recorded history. Now, the third eruption of 2020 occurred at 4.07 UTC, February 2nd, 2020, which is 9.07 p.m. Mountain Time, February 1st, 2020, and here it is right here. And that's just the steamboat eruption, guys, that occurred two days ago. So, now let's move on to the more important stuff. Now, as many of you guys probably already know, there's a magnitude 7.7 .7 at 1910 UTC on January 28th of this year, 2020, near Jamaica. A lot of people reported feeling it, especially far from the epicenter, guys. Um, the buildings in Miami, Florida, which is in southern Florida, were swaying. And you'll see that it is pretty far away from Miami. So I'm guessing this was a little stronger. I'm going to say maybe 7.9, maybe stretching it to an 8. But I really don't think it was bigger than an 8 at the maximum. But it was pretty crazy how the buildings were swaying in Miami just a tad. Just a little bit. Just so much that they evacuated the buildings during that earthquake. So... It was definitely pretty crazy what happened in Miami and what a lot of people reported experiencing from this earthquake that traveled a long, long distance. Now, this earthquake struck right here between Jamaica and Cuba. You can see how far. I mean, you know, Florida isn't that far. There's Miami right there where the buildings were swaying. You know, Miami isn't too, too far, but that's like, what, 300, 400, maybe even 500 miles. I'm not sure the exact number, but. It's pretty far away from the epicenter, and so pretty crazy, guys, that people actually felt it in Miami. Now, we're going to take a look at the historical earthquakes that have occurred in this location, magnitude 7 and above, since January 1st, 1900. So, and we're going to use this area right here. Remember, the earthquake occurred right in this location right here. We're going to use this whole area. So, anything that occurred magnitude 7 and above since the year 1900, we will see in this location. Let's click use region and then let's click search. Let's see what it shows us, guys. Only 10. Okay. So I want you to notice right here. Now, ignore the ones over by Haiti and the Dominican Republic. I'm not really focused on those right now. I'm going to focus on these right here. Now, notice it was, it was a 7.7, .7, maybe a 7.8, 7.9, but it says 7.7. .7. Look, we have a 7.5, 7.0, 7.3, 7.5. 7.0, 7.5, 7 7.3. So since recording for earthquakes, which started around 1900, that's when I actually started keeping databases and stuff like that. Um, it this is the largest one to hit since 1900. 
I mean, over here, there was a 7.7 .7 in Puerto Rico, you know, but I'm just saying this basically is the largest that we've seen in this area since 1900, which, which is crazy. Now, notice something. See this string of earthquakes along the same subduction zone right here? Now, look. This one occurred in 1976 in February. Now go this way. This occurred in 2009. Go this way. This one occurred in 2018. And then this one occurred in 2020. Notice how from here to here to here to here, it occurred in like a timely sequence. Isn't that weird? So up here is the most recent and down here is the least recent. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. Thought I'd show you guys that. But yeah, basically, basically the largest quake that we've seen in this area since 1900. So that definitely is noteworthy. Now the 7.7, .7, guys, was reportedly felt by 1,503 people. I'm telling you right now, since Cuba is a restrictive nation and not many people are going to be reporting from Cuba. You know, maybe some people will. But uh, I'm saying there's probably thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of more people that have felt it. Because these are just the felt reports. Now, I do want to show you the Did You Feel It map, and we're going to see where all those reports came from. Let's see here. Let's go to... Let's see here. Kilometer. Okay. So, we did have a few people in Cuba report feeling it. Not that many, but a few people did report feeling it. Now, in the Grand Cayman Islands, down here... A lot of people felt it. There was even down here in Jamaica some strong shaking in Jamaica from this earthquake. Now let's zoom out. Look at all of the felt reports in Florida. Are you seeing this right now? Look at that. Look at this. Okay, and let's scoot all the way over. We've got felt reports in the Panhandle. We've got felt reports in Louisiana. Even a few felt reports in Houston and Austin, Texas. Even one in northern Louisiana. Um, let's see, a few felt reports in Arkansas. I mean, very, very weak sh shaking. Even in northern Georgia. All the way up to Tennessee and uh, Kentucky. Are you kidding me? That is so crazy, guys. How far? And look, Washington, D.C. Even some people in Washington, D.C. did report feeling this earthquake, guys. And look at that. And even Staten Island, New York. So, this earthquake traveled long, long ways, guys. So, it's very, very intriguing. Let's take a look at the waveforms real quick from the closest seismic station in the Seismic Program Swarm. Now, here we have a seismic station MTDJ, broadband vertical station in the CU Network 00 location code with 1 hertz high pass filter to get rid of those pesky background microseisms. Now, here's the magnitude 7.7 .7 from the closest station, guys. It was a very, very intriguing and strong earthquake. Look at that, guys. Look at that. Aftershock, aftershock, aftershock. I mean, there are a lot of aftershocks associated with this magnitude 7.7. Uh, .7. And, yeah, it was a pretty crazy earthquake, guys. Very, very intriguing. Don't know why there's some of a low-frequency event along with these earthquakes right here. Man, that's kind of intriguing. Huh. Very interesting event, guys. Very, very interesting. A lot of aftershocks, especially this, I believe this was a 6? I think this was a 6.1 right here. Yeah, you can see that there. But it's a little bit further away, kind of to the west of the 7.7 .7 epicenter. So, I thought you guys would like to see that. Now, check this out. Look at how strong the earthquake was detected on seismic stations around Yellowstone. Look at this at YPK near Parker Peak. Look at this, guys. Very, very strong signature from that 7.7 .7 in Jamaica, which, in my opinion, might be a little bit around uh, magnitude 8. Definitely not greater than a magnitude 8. Look at this on station YTP. Look at how strong that is, guys. Very, 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 very strong. Now, since it was felt so far away, and we have felt reports all the way up into New York, I wanted to take a close seismic station in the United States, the closest one to the earthquake, on a station in the U.S. Tried to do this one down here in Florida, but it just was not working very well. So I'm going to take data from this station right here, NHSC in the U.S. network, which is near Charleston, South Carolina. Here we have NHSC. Now look at this, guys. Look at this. Very, very strong signature 
from South Carolina. Now, there's a one hertz high pass filter added to this. And remember, as earthquake waves propagate away from their source, the frequency of the waveforms, um, they drop. So that's why we should see really low frequencies associated with this. That's why teleseisms, which are from great global earthquakes over a thousand kilometers away from the station in question, that's why teleseisms have very low frequencies, usually below one hertz, sometimes peaking around 0 0.1 hertz sometimes. But yeah, here it is right here, guys. It lasted quite a while. No wonder people did feel it because it is showing a very strong up to 10,000 amplitude count on the highest spike right here on this broadband station with one hertz high pass filter. So I thought you guys would like to see that. Now, let's move on. Now, here we have the USGS earthquake map for North and South Korea. Now, you're wondering why I'm probably doing this. Well, this is magnitude 2.5 and above since January 1st, 2010. Notice we have a lot of quakes here, small ones usually, but we did have some nuclear tests, some slightly bigger earthquakes. But look, we have a 3.5 in South Korea, near Myeongyang, South Korea. 3.5, supposedly 10 kilometers in depth. And supposedly, was one person who did, excuse me, report feeling it. So that's very interesting. We're going to take a look at this in the seismic program swarm from the closest seismic station. Now, the most recent one prior to this was surprisingly, and I talked about this in a video a long time ago, a magnitude 3.6, again, supposedly at 10 kilometers in depth, with multiple felt reports around Pyongyang in North Korea. So, very interesting how an earthquake occurred right basically near the capital of North Korea. Uh, yeah, so earthquakes usually do happen around this region, but they're more rare around the center of North and South Korea. They're usually along the coast right here, and then some in the Yellow Sea, and also some in the Japan Basin and out, right out here. Here we have seismic station TJN in the KG network broadband uh, vertical station, and no location code is given, so it would be dash dash if you're looking to download the data. Now, real quick, my bad. Sorry, guys. The earthquake in South Korea occurred at 1552 UTC on January 29th, 2020. Now, going over, I did add a 1 hertz high pass filter to get rid of those pesky background microseisms right here. We see the earthquake. Now, the station is a little bit further away than I would like from the earthquake epicenter. So, we will see some separated P and S wave arrivals. See, P wave starts right about there. S wave starts right about there. You can tell it, it occurred a little bit farther away from the station. Sadly, the spectrogram, or actually the station, only records data up to 10 hertz, which is a little low in my opinion, but we still get a good idea of what happened with this earthquake. And it's hard to see if it's a downward going P wave, but I'm pretty sure it is because you can see some activity starts right back there. But yeah, this is the magnitude 3.5 in South Korea that occurred the other day, guys. Very, very interesting. We usually do not see earthquakes in the Korea area unless it's like a nuclear blast from Kim Jong-un. Now, moving on. Now, here we are at Long Valley Caldera, a super volcano uh, along the Sierra Nevada range in California. Now, we did see some swarming. Now, this past seven days, all magnitudes for Long Valley Caldera, as of 9.24 p.m. Pacific Time, uh, February 3rd, 2020, we have seen 103 reported earthquakes over the past seven days, all magnitudes. Now, uh, that is not crazy, but that is interesting nonetheless. Uh, we did see a little bit of swarming, but the thing I want to talk about right here, let's go to largest magnitude. Notice we see somewhat of a bigger dot right along the southern rim of the caldera, right down here. We saw magnitude 4.4 at 9.8 kilometers in depth from Long Valley Caldera on February 1st, 2020 at 1836 UTC. Let's go to the event page right here. We don't see magnitude 4s at Long Valley very often, guys. We don't. 574 people reported feeling. Remember, that's just the reports, not how many people actually felt it. Here we have the moment tensor right down here. Again, five, 574 reports uh, spanning a long distance, actually. And let's see here. We're going to take a look at this from one of the closest seismic stations. And just take a close look at the magnitude 4.4 and 9.8 kilometers in depth. But first, let's go right here. Now. Here we are back at the USGS earthquake map. Now. 
This is very interesting, guys. We do have 35 reported earthquakes since 1990, January 1st, 1990, to right now, February 3rd, 2020. Now, what we see, now this is magnitude 4 and above, again, since 1990. Magnitude 4 and above. We do see, for magnitude 4s, mostly in this area right down here, guys. Magnitude 4.4, .4, of course, was the most recent, which occurred on February 1st, just the other day. The one before that was in 2011, it was 4.2. Not exactly on the rim of the caldera, but just right down here, a little bit past the rim. But to go and find one that's bigger, you'd have to go all the way back to 2007, June 12, 2007. That's when we saw a 4.6, a little bit further south of the recent 4.4. But notice how many, look at this. 1999, we saw 4.3. But then in 2003, we saw 4.0. So only in the 2000s, in the past 20 years, we have only seen four magnitude 4 and above earthquakes. That's it. One in 2003, then in 2007, then in 2011, and then in 2020. Very, very interesting, guys. Yeah, we have not seen very many. But down in the 90s, especially the 80s, where people were actually starting to become concerned an eruption was coming, it got very, very scary for some people down there. Uh, within a few years, the caldera floor rose, what was it, two and a half feet? I believe that that's a lot. And there were multiple magnitude sixes occurring around the caldera. I mean, it was getting bad. And then all of a sudden, it just kind of calmed down. And we've seen a little bit of uplift here and there at Long Valley, but nothing compares to the activity that started, basically, on May 1980, which is the same month and year that Mount St. Helens erupted. But then again, down in the 90s and the 80s, they had a lot, a lot of activity. But it's been pretty calm since then. But then again... There's a lot of magma down there, guys, I believe. I'm not saying Long Valley's going to erupt or something like that. I mean, it will someday again, but I'm not, I'm not saying that an eruption's coming. But I believe Long Valley is far, far closer to a, an eruption or a super eruption than Yellowstone is. Uh, that, that's just my opinion. Like, Long Valley, man, it's got a lot of magma down there. So let's take a look at the magnitude 4.4 in the Seismic Program Swarm real quick. Here we have data from Seismic Station MLAC in the CI Network Broadband Vertical. No location codes, so it would be dash dash. This is the second closest seismic station, in my opinion. I believe it is second closest to the magnitude 4.4 that occurred at Long Valley Super Volcano, or otherwise known as Caldera. But check this out, guys. Yeah, this is the magnitude 4.4 right here with some strange lower frequencies at the tail end. I mean, the tail end, the coda of an earthquake should always show some low frequencies. But it, it, it starts right, pretty much right in the middle of the earthquake, so I'm not saying that's too strange. It's definitely not a low-frequency earthquake by any standards, but just thought that was interesting. Some deep red showing that raw, raw power. Now let's go here and let's turn down the power just a little bit. Actually, I went the wrong way, I think. Yep, I went the wrong way. Whoops. Remember, color range on a spectrogram means power. Does not mean magma, does not mean gases, does, does not mean any of those rumors that people spread on the internet. It means power. I mean, even when you go on here and change the color, it says power range DB. And so, yep, that's the magnitude 4.4 right there, guys. Look at that. Very, very interesting earthquake. Haven't seen one like this since a while, guys. It's been quite a while. A lot of aftershocks. Look at all the aftershocks. All those little spikes or aftershocks. Then we had a few more quakes. A few more aftershocks going on after that. Nothing too crazy. Now, I'm not really concerned about this 4.4 in and of itself. If it was occurring with multiple other magnitude 3s and magnitude 4s going on for days and days and days, then I would start to get concerned, especially if there were some swelling of the ground. But this is just a 4.4, guys. But still... Please keep an eye on Long Valley. Please keep an eye on it. Because you never know when something might change. Also, guys, I just wanted to give you guys a heads up. Do you remember how a long time ago I ran into this person named Spectronet? I even did a video about this a while ago. Exposing his scams and his frauds. Now, Spectronet said that Swarm, or this is what he said a year ago. Swarm is his, and he helped develop it. And anyone who's on YouTube who live streams seismic data through Swarm 
can get in very, very big trouble through him and through the law because he developed it and he pretty much owns it and he copyrighted his material. Number one, you cannot copyright free seismic data given to us by USGS and private institutions. That's illegal. You can't copyright that stuff. Number two, swarms not developed by the Scott of Spectronet. Not developed by them. It's developed by USGS, the AVO, and Iris. Number three, Spectronet is back. He is. He's been gone for a year, probably because he was kicked off of YouTube for a year. He. It wasn't just me that he harassed. I mean, he filed a copyright strike against me a long time ago for taking a little clip, just posting a little tiny, tiny piece of his live stream of the, size, uh, the spectrogram data on the internet. But guess what? Once he, he was off of YouTube, that copyright strike was gone. I didn't have it anymore. So that shows that it was reversed because I talked to a lot of other people and got in contact with a lot of other YouTube creators out there that do spectrogram, live spectrogram data and do use the program Swarm like I do. And apparently, he was attacking them. He was submitting false copyright claims saying that Swarm was his. Nobody else can stream the seismic program Swarm on YouTube. False copyright infringement and stuff like that. I mean, he, he almost sued some people. And when I, when I talked to him a long time ago, before I did all the copyright stuff, before he tried to get me in trouble, there was, I, I asked him, how do I get the seismic data? He said, seismic data is not free. They're all restricted stations, privately owned, and that I could pay him money to get that seismic data. Do you hear what I'm saying? Pay him money to get that seismic data. So USGS in the end came out on Twitter and actually put out a Twitter post that said Swarm is completely free and is open source, meaning anybody can live stream it, anybody can do whatever the heck they want with it. You can do whatever the heck you want with Swarm except saying that it's yours and charging for it or charging for free seismic data. So that was the problem that dozens, and I thought I was alone. I thought it was maybe like me and some other guy would have run into this problem. But dozens of YouTube creators out there were getting attacked by Spectronet. And then all of a sudden, he just disappeared. He just disappeared right off the face of the earth. And now, as of last month, I think late January 2020, this year, he is back. I don't know if he's still doing the copyright infringement stuff. I don't know if he's still scamming people out of money, but I just want to give you guys a heads up. Just be careful, because remember, Seismic Data is always free. The Seismic Program Swarm is completely free and open source, and my website does prove that. And you don't even need my website. You need to just go to USGS, and they have all that stuff for free. USGS and Iris, all the Seismic Data is free. All their programs are free and open source. Everything is free, 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 free. Like the TurboTax commercial, free. Free, 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 free. Free, free, free. It literally is free. Now, something else that happened recently was on February 3rd, which uh, it was actually last night, um, there was a magnitude 4.2 at 7.7 kilometers in depth right down here, 7 kilometers south of Volcano Hawaii. Now, all the way down here. Now, this USGS earthquake map is from September 20th, 2018. All the way through right now, February 3rd, 2020. And magnitude 4 and above. You do see, right down here, this earthquake last night occurred right near the magnitude 5.5, which occurred way earlier this year. Uh, March 13th, 2019. Actually, that was last year. My bad. Sorry. <laughs> um, so this 5.5 occurred basically in the same location as the 4.2 we saw last night. Um... Here's Kilauea right here. Pu'uo'o is right here. Um, right around the same depth. Look at the depth of these three earthquakes that we've seen since September of 2018. 7 kilometers, 6.9 kilometers, 7.7 .7 kilometers. Definitely probably related to the magmatic activity that takes place down there. Um, and yeah, the most recent larger earthquake on the big island. To find something large, you have to go to the magnitude 4.9, which is November 11th, 2019, at 32.6 kilometers in depth under Mauna Kea Volcano, all the way up here. So it's been a little while since we've seen a magnitude 4, and uh, this magnitude 4.2 occurred during an increase in seismicity, which I actually do talk about in a blog post update, which I'm going to show you right now. 
So I usually do put monthly updates, by the way, under the monthly volcano updates down here. I have not done an uplift subsidence update for like four months, so that's something I really need to get done. I'm going to do soon. It's going to be a video update of uplift subsidence patterns over the past year for Long Valley Caldera, Yellowstone Caldera, and the Ridgecrest Coastal Volcanic Field area. Uh, so, but the monthly volcano updates, I'm going to try to put that out tomorrow night. But so keep checking over here. This will be up in the next day or so. Um, but I usually do under my Hawaii blog, I do monthly Hawaii updates, but mainly for spasmodic tremor or significant activity. I forgot to do one for December. So I made a post last night for December 2019 through January 2020. Tremor and quakes. And here we see, as an intro, we see the spasmodic tremor from station TRAD in the HV network, which occurred on January 17th, 2020. Now, quake, spasmodic tremor, and continued deformation is the name of the game during these past two months. Spasmodic tremor continued to decline in December 2019 and January 2020. There was even an increase in swarming and magnitude 3 plus earthquakes in late January. Please click the title of this post to read more to continue which I already did. Now, Mauna Loa is currently experiencing heightened volcanic unrest, including increased seismicity and uplift, swelling, inflation. Therefore, the alert level has been raised to advisory, and the aviation color code has been raised to yellow. Please click here. And by the way, guys, if you've already read this blog post, just skip the rest of this video, because this is the last thing of the video. I'm going to leave a link to this blog post in the description box below, if you would rather read it yourself instead of sit Sit he sitting here and watching me read it basically so you can do that if you want if you do choose to do that just end the video because this is the end of the video um please click here this button right here to keep up to date with recent alert postings by hvo for mauna loa's potential eruptive activity in the near future now as seen in the picture right here a pond of water larger than a football stadium has been constantly growing at the bottom of halimaumau crater inside of kilauea caldera it was originally thought to be rainwater, but HVO now confirms this intrusion is deeply rooted in groundwater. No pun intended. This could possibly spell trouble for Kilauea in the future. Sulfur dioxide is actively dissolved in the lake, making accurate SO2 readings from rising magma extremely difficult. Now to keep an eye on this growing lake, please keep checking the Volcano Watch articles put out by HVO, which can be found here. There's another button. Also, you can keep an eye on it yourself. If you monitor the webcams at Kilauea, which can be found here, click that. Picture and video updates from HVO, which can be found here, and click that too, which is my favorite way to monitor the growing lake and their updates. Now, right here, you will notice I do have a button called USGS Interactive Quake Map, all magnitudes, December 1st, 2019 through January 31st, 2020, and Hawaii Station Map. Hawaii Station Map shows you all the active seismic stations on the complete Hawaii chain. Um, actually, no way. I think it's just the big island. I don't know. I don't remember. You just, just click that. You'll see all the seismic stations of Hawaii. And click this is very important and good resource for you right here for December through January and reported seismicity there. Now, there were 1,053 reported earthquakes from December 1st, 2019 through January 31st, 2020 for the entire island chain of Hawaii, which Pretty much all of them occurred on the Big Island, obviously, but still. In those two months, approximately 75% of the reported earthquakes occurred deep under Pahala, Hawaii, within the Mantle Plume Conduit, right where spasmodic tremor occurs. Speaking of spasmodic tremor, notice those deep earthquakes, 25 kilometers to 60 kilometers in depth, under Pahala, Hawaii? Well, those are occurring within the Mantle Plume, where spasmodic tremor has recently been prevalent. If you wish to understand what volcanic spasmodic tremor is and how it relates to ongoing volcanic unrest in Hawaii, please click there. It's a really good resource. And actually, you can find it if you just simply go up to the Hawaii menu and go to Hawaii spasmodic tremor. That's that link. That's linked right there. And pretty much if you look at that, you can kind of monitor these areas yourself for spasmodic tremor yourself. It's very fun when you actually pick out a spasmodic tremor. I, I love it. One of my favorite events, actually. Now, before I get to showing spasmodic tremor for December 2019 and January 2020, I wanted to quickly notify you about an increase in seismicity which started on January 29th and continues to the time that I'm writing this, 8.07 UTC, February 3rd, 2020, though in a diminished form. 
Spasmodic tremor over the past seven months has slowly been replaced by earthquake swarms for the same hypocenters, and hypocenter means depth and location. Remember, an epicenter is just the location above the ground, right on the surface. That's the location where the earthquake occurred. Like, imagine an earthquake occurred deep underground, but you place a dot right on the surface, right above where it occurred. That's an epicenter. Hypocenter is more accurate since that's the actual depth and location where it occurred. So, for the same hypocenters as the spasmodic tremor events I have widely talked about and shown data for. Deep swarming within the mantle plume conduits under Pahala, Hawaii are nothing new since the eruptions on the Big Island stopped in September 2018. However, January 29, 2020 saw quite an interesting increase in seismicity, coupled with an increase in high magnitude 2s and some magnitude 3s in the shallow crust around Kilauea and the Lower East Rift Zone. It's interesting to note, many earthquakes ranging from magnitude 2.9 to 4.2 started striking around the Big Island volcanoes during this time range of increased deep seismicity under Pahala, Hawaii, showing there must be a connection in some way of the deep magmatic processes occurring within the mantle plume conduits, which feed the volcanoes on the Big Island, and activity that occurs in the more shallow portions of the crust around Kilauea and the Lurs. Just a few of the larger earthquakes during that time frame are shown below, and I'll read them off for you. Um, and I do have a button that says click here to see the USGS earthquake map of Hawaii for January 29th through February 4th, 2020, and the map will be automatically updated if it isn't February 4th yet, but basically it is. Magnitude 4.2 at 7.7 .7 kilometers in depth February 3rd, 2020 at 637 UTC approximately 9.5 kilometers southeast of Kilauea Caldera and 10 kilometers southwest of Pu'uo'o. Over 300 felt reports, the largest earthquake on the Big Island since the deep 4.9 at Mauna Kea Volcano on November 11, 2019, and the largest at the Kilauea Lurs since the 5.5 at 7 kilometers in depth, which occurred on March 13, 2019, which struck basically in the same location. More of the larger earthquakes that occurred because of the increase in seismicity were the magnitude 3.8 at 5.5 kilometers in depth on January 29th, 2020 at 2223 UTC, about 18 kilometers east-southeast of Pu'uo'o along the coast. 73 felt reports. 3.2 at 31.7 kilometers in depth on February 1st, 2020 at 2233 under Pahala, Hawaii within the Mantle Plume Conduit. And a magnitude 3.0 at 7.2 kilometers in depth on January 30th, 2020 at 1151 UTC just south of Pu'uo'o for felt reports. Then a magnitude 3.0 at 32 kilometers in depth on February 1st at 1348 UTC under Pahala, Hawaii within the Mantle Plume Conduit. And then a magnitude 3.0 at 3 kilometers in depth again on February 1st and again at 1348 UTC, just a few kilometers south of Pu'uo'o, and struck at the same time as the quake I just listed. Now, magnitude 3 earthquakes are nothing to worry about and are not major by any standard. However, magnitude 3 earthquakes rarely have struck the Big Island for many months now, especially the recent magnitude 4.2. I mean, they do occur every now and then, but it doesn't happen all the time. When we see an increase in seismicity within the mantle plume conduits, coupled with an increase in higher magnitude earthquakes in the shallow crust, we must see that there is some correlation. The exact correlation still eludes me to this day. Now the helicopter plots here, in slideshow format, show quakes from 13 UTC, January 29th, 2020, to 10.05 UTC, February 2nd, 2020. 136 earthquakes were reported during this time frame on the Big Island. Of course, some were not able to be located accurately, so this count is likely slightly higher. However, 88 quakes were reported in the deep mantle plume conduits beneath Pahala, Hawaii, where spasmodic tremor occurs. That means over 75% of the recent increase in seismicity, and the earthquakes you see on the helicopters below, or right here, occurred within the mantle plume conduits. So basically, guys, 75% of recent seismicity in Hawaii has been deep within the Mantle Plume Conduit. The heli pots, excuse me, the heli quarter plots 
were filtered with a 1.1 Hz high pass filter and were retrieved using the Iris Time Series tool. Now it's so weird guys that whenever the location code is dash dash and the data is retrieved from time series, a glitch occurs on the helicopter plots where the location code is shown as dash 12345 as seen right here. I still am unsure as to why this happens. Now here are the seismogram plots from the six closest stations to the magnitude 4.2 that occurred on February 3rd, 2020. There it is right there, guys. From the six closest stations. Notice we have some little bit of lower frequencies in the coda, which is normal, but I don't think this is actually a volcanic earthquake because it's not really a low frequency earthquake. But I definitely do believe that magmatic processes did cause this event right here. Alright, scrolling down. Here are the spectrogram plots from the same stations listed above of the magnitude 4.2. And again, guys, if you ever need any seismic data to look at this stuff yourself, just go to my website here and go to the How To drop down menu right here. I teach you how to retrieve seismic data and how to open it in certain programs, how to use some of those programs, and how to actually understand certain plots. And so, so this will basically my How To drop down menu will give you a way to analyze these things yourself. It sounds hard, guys. It sounds hard, but really, it's fun to do. Very, very, very easy to do. And understanding these things does take a little bit of time, but after looking at a lot of data for months and months, you will start to get the hang of it. I mean, I, I mean, really, you'll get the hang of it within a few weeks. You know, like, I never used to know what the difference was between a high-frequency earthquake or a low-frequency earthquake. Hell, I didn't even know that I could filter plots. I didn't know that I could even read broad broadband helicorders because I used to be like oh I don't know how to read broad uh, uh, broadband plots at all I don't know how to read that stuff guys I can only read short period well that's ridiculous because I have this whole teaching area for you guys to learn now let's move on let's move on now let's get to all the spasmodic tremor events which occurred for both December 2018 and January 2020 Remember, seismic audio is included beneath the plots. An 8,000 audio frame rate, samples per second, was used to increase the speed greatly of the audio to allow for easy listening to each spasmodic tremor event. The Iris Time Series tool was used to retrieve the seismic audio from station PPLD, and the Iris Data Select tool was used to retrieve this seismic data. Now, guys, I am not going to play the seismic audio on this video. If you want to hear the seismic audio, simply go to the description box below and click the link that I have put right down there under links in the description box, and you should be good to listen to the audio. Pretty sure I got all the audio up there correctly. I believe that it was downloaded correctly, and I have listened to it, and so you're good, guys. Go check it out. It's actually really cool. Some of the small spasmodic tremor events really aren't that cool to listen to, but the bigger ones... The bigger ones are really, really awesome to listen to. So, event number one. Oh, and also, guys, if there are ever any mistakes, please, please do not hesitate to let me know. I love, love constructive criticism, and I'm very OCD about having things correct on my website. For, exam for example, errors in vocabulary or grammar or setting or errors in times for when earthquakes occur. You know, stuff like that. So please let me know if you ever see any errors at all. I will not get mad. I actually need those. Um, I actually need that constructive criticism. So, event number one. <clears throat> this spasmodic tremor occurred on December 7th, 2019 at 1405 UTC. It was weak, lasted a mere 10 minutes, which is the shortest spasmodic tremor I have encountered. There it is right there. And I always use three stations across the big island of Hawaii. Because some of these spasmodic tremor events on one station, when just looking at it, they look like surface events. They look like surface noise. But if you use three stations, which are tens of miles in between each other, the exact same surface event cannot appear on every single station 
uh, tens of miles away. So, for example, PPLD is a long distance away from HUAD, and especially TRAD. So I kind of have one station on the southern coast, one station in the middle of the Big Island, and then another station near um, Hualalai, which is kind of near the northwestern coast. So I have it across the whole Big Island for these three stations. So if they correlate correctly, and you can tell they do, it's spasmodic tremor, baby. So that's the first one right there. Event 2. This spasmodic tremor occurred on December 18th, 2019 at 1920 UTC. Again, it was weak and lasted only 10 minutes, which is extremely short for any spasmodic tremor, guys. I mean, that's... But then again, it was weak, too, so... You could tell I almost missed this one, too. You could tell, though, notice right here, compared to right here, these stations are, again, miles away from each other. And then this increase right here, compared to right here. And it kind of weakens in this middle. It weakens in the middle. And notice right here, right here, compared to right here, and right here. Notice that? Going down. Event 3. Spasmodic tremor occurred on December 18th, 2019 at 2122 UTC. It was so weak that I almost missed it, and it only lasted 19 minutes, guys. It was very weak. But then again, you can see the increase on PPLD right here, right here. Lasting, kind of weakening right before this spike. It kind of weakens right before this. It's hard to see on PPLD. But you can definitely see it on TRAD and HUAD. Spasmodic tremor occurred on December 29, 2019 at 9.08 UTC. It was weak and lasted 36 minutes. The earthquakes that you can see in the plots may or may not be related to the spasmodic tremor of this day. Notice how there were a lot of spikes, a lot of deep earthquakes in the mantle plume, but a few of these earthquakes, for example, I believe this one was not within the mantle plume under Pahala. But you could definitely see the tremor right along there, right along there. Remember, spasmodic tremor sometimes is just tremor itself. Remember, tremor is not an earthquake. But sometimes spasmodic tremor is made up of a little bit of tremor, but mostly earthquakes in just a short period of time. So it's it's very, um, let's just say the spasmodic tremor is very dynamic. Oh yeah. And there you can see it there. All right, so event number five. All right, spasmodic tremor occurred on December 29th, 2019 at 9.48 UTC. It was the strongest of December 2019 and January 2020 and lasted 36 minutes. Actually, that's not long at all. The longest one I've ever seen is 1 hour and 10 minutes. For example, if you go to the Hawaii spasmodic tremor page, remember the one I talked about earlier? You will see the largest one I've ever witnessed and the longest one I've ever witnessed. But this is definitely a good sized one right here, guys. You could definitely see when they are medium to uh, to strong. Uh, you could definitely see them on like every station on the Big Island, no matter what. And there it is, there, guys. There it is. And if you ever, if you guys ever want me to send you some custom made plots just for whatever you want, just let me know. Shoot me an email. You got my email in the description box below. All right. Happy New Year. Spasmodic tremor occurred on January 16th, 2020 at 1844 UTC. It was extremely weak. And this one I definitely almost missed. This tremor lasted only 19 minutes. All right. Spasmodic tremor occurred on January 17th, 2020 at 657 UTC. It was arguably the second strongest spasmodic tremor of December 2019 through January 2020 and lasted 30 minutes. It almost was the strongest, guys. Almost. But I believe the other one that I showed was the strongest. But you can definitely see it show up on all three of these stations, which are around the Big Island of Hawaii. Again, come to my article post here, which I'll leave a link to in the description box below if you want to hear the audio, the seismic audio of these events. All right. Spasmodic tremor occurred on January 29th, 2020 at 1045 UTC. 
It was sort of weak, but surprisingly lasted 40 minutes. Again, notice this. I'm going to call it a box. Notice how it starts right here, goes over here, and right here. Notice it kind of looks like there's a little bit of an increase in energy in this boxed area right here. Go down here, notice the same thing. This little, quote-unquote, boxed area saw an increase in activity. But it's not an earthquake, but it's tremor. Notice the increases in activity here and here as well. And there's the seismic audio. And guys, feel free to leave a reply to anything that you see on my website. I'd love to hear from you guys, especially if you send uh, shoot a comment to the uh, comment box below on this video. Now remember guys, I will be doing my monthly update either tonight. I'm actually going to work on it tonight, so it might be up by tomorrow morning. Um, but definitely check back on it in the next day, maybe in the next few hours or so. Um, a lot of other things on my website. For example, if there's a swarm in any random location around the U.S., I have my Quake Swarms blog. These other three blogs I don't use too often, but every once in a while I will add something to that. My Seismo blog is kind of for random seismic stuff or even some other random things like if I think it's going to snow like crazy because I love snow. I'll put, you know, updates about that in there or I'll put other updates about my life in there. So really, I do not use Seismo blog too much anymore. I primarily focus on Yellowstone drop down menu, the Hawaii drop down menu and the how to drop down menu. If you guys want to learn about seismic events and see what certain seismic events look like, go to event examples under the seismic events menu. If those of you out there are wondering, what does harmonic tremor look like? What's the difference between a harmonic volcanic tremor? Actually, harmonic volcanic tremor is basically the same thing. Uh, what's a high frequency earthquake compared to a low frequency earthquake? What is spasmodic tremor? What does a hydrothermal eruption look like on a seismograph? All those things are described here. We got a high frequency earthquake right there. A high frequency tectonic earthquake. I have a high frequency tectonic quake compared to a high frequency volcano tectonic earthquake. Low frequency earthquake. We got a hybrid earthquake, which is more of a rare type of earthquake, so it's very hard to find. But the uh, events at Yellowstone in 2009 gave us a rare glimpse into what hybrid earthquakes look like during an earthquake swarm. Going down, we have a teleseismic signature, which is the signature from a global quake. Now, this is not it. This is the local signature right here. And I show, see, I look right down here. I show comparison. That's not the teleseism. This is. Notice that. Look at that. Look how the frequency is lowered. That is because frequencies drop with distance. And a bunch of other stuff that I have on here for you guys. Even, even what volcanic eruptions look like. Even what instrument malfunctions and glitches look like. And also, I'm kind of a nerd for seismology. So I put a thing in here about whale calls. I don't know if I already talked about this, guys, but... I was very intrigued when I found out from a buddy of mine that I talk to every once in a while, Mike out there. Um, he showed me some whale calls on seismic stations, and then I looked it up, and they're actually trying to use seismometers to track certain whale populations because of their whale calls, which I thought was pretty freaking cool, guys. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm just a nerd for seismology. I love this hobby. Uh, this plot was not created by myself, but these ones down here, I created a bunch of plots of what the whale calls look like off the coast of Washington and Oregon. So go check that out if you want, guys. And remember, I'm always here on my website. I got things that I put on here without putting a video out, so always check back every now and then. Uh, let's see, has anything else occurred? Let's see if anything else has occurred since I have been recording. Uh-oh. It's not letting me go to the latest earthquakes. Come on. Okay. Nothing really much has happened magnitude 2.5 and above wise. Uh, all magnitudes. It's been pretty quiet today actually along the west coast. Pretty quiet. A little bit of activity in Montana. Tiny, tiny, tiny swarm in Yellowstone. Then we surprisingly saw magnitude 4.3 in Canada at 10.6 kilometers in depth. Up in that location right there. Actually, let's take a very, very, very quick look at the waveform and frequency data of this event. 
So apparently this area is very sparse with population, so the closest station that detected this event was 63.2 seconds away. That means it took 63.2 seconds over a minute to arrive on the station, So, but we'll still take a look at it. So very quickly here we have some data from SCHQ, Broadband Vertical in the CN Network in Canada, dash dash location code because none is given. I set a 1 hertz high pass filter. Now again, this strange uh, 4.3 occurred on February 3rd, 2020 at 1758 UTC. It took a little bit over a minute, about a minute and three seconds to arrive on the station. And we see in the proper time right here, here is the event. Very strange how there are some slightly lower frequencies in the P waves, but the S waves have slightly higher frequencies. Notice that? That is very strange in my opinion. And look at this, guys. It is very... Actually, wait, no. Are those two earthquakes? Because it looks like there's another P and S wave arrival. P and S wave arrival, right? Wait a second. What? Okay, never mind. I was wrong. This whole thing, starting right here to right here, is the P waves. Starting right here to right here is the S waves. And I don't think we have any surface waves, Rayleigh or Love waves associated to this. And there's an aftershock right here. Right there. So, very, very strange event, <clears throat> excuse me, which happened in Canada. Actually, happened in Canada right in. Let me go over right in this location right here, guys. Very intriguing. So. That is pretty much it. Let's zoom to the world. See if anything else has occurred. Just some more quakes in Pahala, Hawaii, under the or inside the mantle plume. That's about it. Don't forget to check my website for all the different stuff I added. God bless, guys. Don't forget to take the seismic quiz and put your results in the comment section. God bless, and I will see you guys later.